There has been a tsunami of job resignations in the U.S. workforce recently. The Great Resignation. The Great Resignation. The Great Resignation. And that's what some experts are calling the growing trend of workers quitting or just changing careers. People just simply saying, I'm not going back to work. The Great Resignation and the pandemic have raised pressing questions about work and careers. Where we work, how we balance work and family, and the overall conditions of our workplaces. In season two of the podcast, we're expanding the questions around the future of work and asking, if we're living and working longer, how can we have 50 or 60 year careers that make sense? Ones that allow us the time to invest in our families, communities, and ourselves. To be productive but not exhausted, and that give everyone a shot at opportunity over the course of longer careers. This is Century Lies from the Stanford Center on Longevity, I'm your host, Ken Stern. Season two of the podcast is coming soon, but we're warming up by learning a bit about work rules and work cultures in other countries. The pandemic hit every country, but the great resignation did not. We're traveling to find out why. Today, we're zipping across the Atlantic, at least partway, to Iceland, the first country to elect a woman as president, the first country to kick out McDonald's, and now the first country with widespread adoption of a 36-hour work week. Yes, my name is, uh, uh, well, actually, my real name is Guðrún Svava, but I know no one in America can pronounce that, so I'm always called Duna. I think I could pronounce her name. Okay, and then let's work on the last name for a second. Um, Baldursdóttir. Wow, I'm not going to Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bald, okay. Bald, bald, Baldus, yeah. Baldus, yeah. yeah. Dóttir. Baldur Stutter? My name, my, my dad's Stutter. name is Baldur. All right, Baldur Stutter. Yeah. Is that yeah. right? All right. Pretty good. All right, I feel like I've accomplished something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, at least I tried my best. Duna works with teenagers, running an after school program. She's also a mother, and recently she has been taking advantage of Iceland's shortened work week. When we implemented it at our, our, our workplace, we are taking every other Friday off. So I never work every other, other Friday. And my husband, he's at another job, and he's working um, seven hours, three days, and seven and a half hours, two days. When Duna first heard about the change, she was excited. I thought it was a brilliant idea. I thought it was just, it sounded great. Um, and I believed it would have positive effect on the employees and their contribution to the workplace. One extra day off every two weeks sounds great, but it also seems like a relatively small adjustment in hours. Does having a few extra hours off every week really make a big difference to parents and to families? Yeah. I just, the answer is yes. It's just, we, <laughs> yeah, we, we are... Um, Flat out yes. yes. Yeah. It, it's just we are uh, more calm and there's not as much stress going on. And it's just, it, it has helped us to be a better parent. I'm confident. With this extra time, he has um, he has actually time to go and pick up our kids from daycare. Um, I get to you know the Fridays I take off. I sometimes I just sleep in, and sometimes I go swimming or running or doing anything, something in the morning, and then long lunch breaks with my friends that are also taking work off the same Friday, or you know get to go to the grocery store without kids. That's a uh, that's a bonus. <laughs> Maybe shorter work weeks and better work-life balance leads to higher job satisfaction and greater employee retention, a win for employees and employers alike. Did this help Iceland avoid its own great resignation? Actually, um, I haven't heard of it here. I haven't heard of people are resin, you know, quitting their jobs because of the pandemic. It's not in the news or anything that it's the problem. But why 36? There's no magic in the 40-hour work week. Is there in 36? Or will be 32 or even lower someday. Yeah, I'm confident that um, someday it will be like that. I'm confident because bosses and people that are in charge, they are um, experienced, happier work, and employees that are willing to work hard for a shorter time. You shouldn't have to work that amount of time to have a good life. Until 2015, Iceland, like the United States, adhered to the 40-hour work week. But that year, 
In an early echo of what we have heard during the pandemic, powerful Icelandic trade unions began to argue for better work-life balance. And in response, the Reykjavik City Council and the Icelandic national government began a trial of a 35 or 36 hour work week. Another trial followed in 2017 and in total over 2,500 workers got involved, more than 1% of Iceland's working population. The trials included both typical nine to five workers and shift workers and took place in a variety of workspaces, including offices, schools, hospitals, and even a police station. In general, workers maintained their compensation and workloads but sought productivity gains to accomplish the same amount in less time. Both major studies concluded, with some small exceptions, that productivity remained the same or improved across the majority of workplaces, and worker well-being increased across the board. Following the trials, Iceland's trade unions bargained for shortened work weeks for their members. Now, roughly 86% of Iceland's working population have either moved to shortened hours or have gained the right to do so. To find out more about Iceland's shift to a shortened work week, we spoke with Jack Kellum, a UK-based researcher who co-authored the 2021 study. Yep, so my name's Jack Kellum, uh, and I'm a researcher at Autonomy, a UK-based think tank who are focused on the future of work. Autonomy is a research shop, but it's also known for its advocacy of worker rights in general and shorter work weeks in particular. I asked Jack what has been the impact of the pandemic on the public's perception of a shorter work week. There's been increasing awareness that we are working more and more, that there's potentially a crisis of overwork in lots of modern economies. You know, people work long hours, they feel burnt out, and they see their working lives bleeding into their personal and social lives at the same time. Nevertheless, I think what COVID has done is ask people to really reflect on the place of work in their lives. All of a sudden, I think... We saw how central work really was to the structure of our day-to-day lives, the amount of time we put into it, because all of a sudden many of us were not going to offices, were not going to workplaces, or potentially had some greater freedom to arrange the structure of our working day uh, in a way that they hadn't before. So I think the effect of COVID has, it's pushed in different directions. For some people, it's seen an increase in workload, I think, uh, that's come along with some of these moves. So people feel like they're working more and more. But I think they're also increasingly aware that lots of, things we take for granted about how our lives are structured can change very, very quickly and also not necessarily fall apart. Um, Lots of, you know, huge numbers of companies move to remote working incredibly quickly and with some teething issues, for the most part, broadly managed it. Reasonably okay, right? The world didn't completely fall fall apart. So I think now, now all of a sudden, I think people are beginning to reassess exactly, exactly how they would best like to structure their working lives. And working time and a four-day working week, I think, is one, uh, one increasingly prominent part of that. The pandemic and the Great Resignation have caused a reevaluation among both workers and employers on the balance between work and family and the boundaries we draw around our work lives. Although Iceland's trials began before the pandemic, their results ended up being directly relevant to these questions. The headline results were that um, there were significant improvements in workers' well-being, so workers felt better rested, um, coming into the job. They felt like they performed better in their job. And that was borne out by assessments of their productivity or service provision in some of the settings they were in. So um, performance was maintained against lots of their pre-trial standards. Uh, and the evaluative feedback, which was quite rich and varied from the study, also showed similar, similar evidence for improved well-being and productivity. It is working 34, 35, 36 hours now the norm in Iceland? And how's it actually worked out in real life? There's no one, there is no now particular one norm across the country and across these workplaces. Iceland is uh, comparative, particularly with the US, a very heavily unionized uh, country where often uh, workplace contracts are negotiated uh, according with each sort of workplace and sector and so on, and the specifics often vary slightly with each of these settings. So there's no one uh, particular set of hours that have worked across these different workplaces. Nevertheless, there has been a move to allow people to move towards shorter working hours. Uh, if they choose, that's an option they can move towards. We still don't know exactly how, how many people have moved towards these shorter working weeks following the trials. That's something we're trying to maintain really close contact with our colleagues on the ground in Iceland about, and we'll be really interested in following up soon. But I think it's certainly shifted the conversation in Iceland around the politics of politics of work and of working time there. So 
prior to these trials, there was a certainly within Iceland's uh, national sort of culture and consciousness, people were aware that they worked long working hours, at least compared to many of their neighbouring countries who they commonly measure themselves against. So even though Iceland is a comparatively wealthy country, particularly per capita, it nevertheless has really quite, prior to these trials, really quite long working hours for the same amount of wealth. So people, so working time was um, something that people there were, were aware was something which was particularly long compared to it, um, many of its uh, close, uh, close by neighbours. So I, I think these trials have shone a light on that and have, have led people to perhaps reassess uh, what might be best for, for the country going forward. The Iceland experiment rested on the somewhat counterintuitive notion that people would be able to work less and produce the same amount. But that's hardly a new notion. In the 1910s and 1920s, when factories were assessing whether to adopt the 40-hour work week in place of the then more common 45- or 50-hour work week, productivity studies frequently showed that eight hours of work would actually produce more than nine or ten. This all instilled confidence in Henry Ford so that he could famously adopt the 40-hour work week in 1926. But there we have stayed for almost the last century. So on the one hand, there's the basic concept that we can produce the same or more in less, less time. Uh, and I think as a basic, you know, often this runs uh, counter to the sort of work ethic that we've inherited as uh, modern societies, in which we often assume that, you know, there's a direct correlation between the number of hours we work and something the amount we produce. But we know, and it's borne out time and time again in lots of uh, both social scientific, but also our own perhaps personal anecdotal evidence, that doesn't always work to be the case. You know, if we're working while we're tired or burnt out or stressed, yeah, well, we often produce far less in that time than we do when we're well rested, healthy, and focused. Uh, I think that's something which people commonly recognise when they begin to reflect on it. So, in principle, the idea of being able to produce more or better quality uh, in a short amount of time, you know, it should be readily accessible to people, even if um, uh, this, yeah, this is going to vary by specific circumstances. Um, talking about the specifics of the. Uh, the Iceland's trials and how this was brought out in those settings. I mean, I think it's uh, it's often difficult sometimes to measure productivity across, across lots of these different workplaces, and particularly in settings where we are talking about service services provided to uh, citizens, for instance, through national government departments, rather than simply sales made in a company, right? Which offers a, maybe offers a more, more ready way to track productivity. But nevertheless, there were a variety of standards that were established across these workplaces to try and track productivity, as well as valuing uh, both workers and managers' quality to feedback on this as to how they felt transitions had been made. And we found that across the diversity of workplaces that were involved, that service provision, so the amount of customers' calls that could be responded to at various call centres, or the number of social security cases that were followed up on and carried through to their results and so on, were able to, um, across workplaces, either track the levels that they were at prior to these reduced hours or to potentially improve their per hour performance. So there's a diversity of case studies covered in the study, but the general trend across these was to see improved productivity uh, and service provision. The 36-hour work week has proven popular for workers of all ages, including mid-career workers like Duna. But the notion of reduced and flexible work may be particularly popular with older workers. Icelanders on average have careers that last 47 years, and that's a number that's going up over time. Long careers may be a logical corollary of longer life, but it may be that pacing work over longer years will prove to be both popular and necessary. As part of our work at Autonomy, we've also worked in uh, Scotland uh, with public sector workers for the Scottish government, um, where, we did some con where we did some initial consultation work about potential moves to a shorter working week for them. And one of the recurring themes we found there was for workers approaching retirement age or potentially approaching retirement age in coming decades, uh, they found the prospect of a shorter working week a really attractive uh, method of potentially moving toward moving to a gradual reduction of working hours towards retirement or keeping on forms of employment as they as they get older in, in, in their lives and so on so a shorter working week yeah on the one hand uh, offers a possibility to 
introduced more phased moves, I think, towards uh, uh, retirement you know, in aging populations. But I think, as you said, also in, in, in the short term, potentially, you know, potentially if we are facing longer working lives, which I think all of us are across many economies, it also offers a way to reduce the toll it's taking on us, both physically and mentally in the years intervening. I think that's why, you know, people, I think, are increasingly aware that we are going to be working longer, and that a more sustainable relationship to work is going to be completely necessary to to, to, to make this possible. And that something like a reduction in working time for a four-day week is a really powerful way to, to do so. The case for the four-day work week has found purchase in Iceland and a number of other countries, but remains largely unknown in the United States. I asked Jack how he would make the case here, where some already believe that we're a nation of slackers being outworked by China. On the one hand, there's as much a crisis of underemployment in places like the US as there is anything else. There are millions who would like to be in work, but are currently not, or find themselves doing jobs that they don't particularly want to do and which are not particularly socially productive, right? So this comes back to the basic idea that the sheer amount of work done per se uh, isn't really a good measure of productivity or of socially useful production per se, for, for, or for national purposes or for whatever purposes. So it's better thinking about the quality of work and what that work is directed towards rather than the sheer number of hours worked. Uh, and I think that's somewhat something like a four-day week is able to push us towards, is to push us to reflect on, on why we're working and for what purposes and our capabilities to perform a task well while we're doing it, so much as literally just working the hours to, to put them in. It's about working in, in clever ways, not just working more. Uh, I think the, the more that's realised, the um, greater buy and the greater spread that's like a four-day week can have. That, of course, is the work side of the equation. Equally important is the potential value that it brings to families and to the division of domestic labor between men and women. Duna told us not only about how reduced hours liberated her to help the family, but also freed her husband up to more regularly participate in parenting. One of the really uh, powerful aspects of the Icelandic trials was quite how much qualitative data was generated through, through interviews with participants, which we don't have often got in many of these other trials we've seen worldwide. On the, on the one hand, I think that, you know, people uh, had a diverse range of experiences with their, um, with their newfound free time. So we found some people saying that you know, they simply just used it to rest a bit more. They relaxed, they watched Net Netflix or other streaming services uh, and found enjoyment from their extra hours this way. Whereas others found that uh, they were able to take up hobbies that they hadn't really found time to before or juggle or more easily structure them within their working lives. But I think some of the most powerful and um, interesting findings um, that uh, participants talked about were, but yeah, potentially around caring responsibilities in domestic divisions of labour. So um, on the one hand, parents felt like they had more time to see, see their kids. I think they found that even a few hours a week made quite a big difference for being able to pick children up after school and do an activity with them rather than just go home and follow a normal family routine. But, but as well, they also found that, you know, Within the household, there was a move towards slightly more equal divisions of labour, that um, greater hours took place as not exclusively husbands, but often men were able to take on greater caring responsibilities for children and fit those into their working lives. But also just even with domestic chores and tasks too, there were accounts of people saying that they felt as though men had made greater contributions to cleaning tasks and so on. So I think, look, it was only uh, a reduction of a handful of hours per week in these cases, um, which I think sometimes people have taken to mean a, to be a relatively insignificant move. But I think what's quite interesting is often participants said they were surprised by how much different even a few hours made a week, knowing that they could for, you know, use that time to take other, you know, just as much as it was a psychological relief, I think, as people knew they just had a bit of time just to get through those extra set of chores or tasks in their week that they wouldn't have to rush through before or after work. Autonomy is involved in similar the less developed efforts in other countries like Spain. So could this ever happen in the US? So I think in the US, the moves to a four-day week have, pri yeah, have primarily been uh, amongst individual employers, generally in sort of knowledge, information, creative sectors of the economy. And it's been a sort of workplace by workplace sector with people who see themselves as forward thinking, I think, uh, managers and so on pushing towards a shorter working week. And I think there's been a broader cultural interest in it. There's certainly been a host of books that have been published, I think, in recent months, particularly over the politics of a shorter working week. And, we have, and we've certainly had quite a lot of interest from the US when we publish these reports. So at least there at least is something, I think, amongst people's um, 
consciousness at the moment about reassessing work and the place of work in our lives and feeling as though they're potentially overworked. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it plays, plays out. It's one thing to advocate for short hours. It's another thing entirely to eat your own cooking. So does autonomy have a four day work week or are they all grinding out their reports around the clock? We, are, we, we, we work with our friends at a four day week campaign to be a four day week accredited employer. So, so this campaign runs an accreditation scheme in the UK. So we work four day weeks, although many of us work different part-time contracts for the most part. So we're, as I said earlier, we try and work around that by reducing working time proportionally and in accordance with how that works. And we're given uh, our own autonomy to decide exactly um, when we'd like to take those sort of working hours. So I'm a fairly keen cyclist. So if it gives me the scope to do some training rides outside uh, on sunny afternoons, I certainly have made, certainly made the most of a short working week. You could be forgiven if you find all this interesting, but rather abstract for those of us in the United States. We are, after all, the land of the Protestant work ethic and worker burnout. But the pandemic may be one of those inflection points in history that motivate a rethink of how and why we work, so much so that the idea of recalibrating our hours might be up for review. In recent polling, more than half of American workers reported being burnt out, and 83% of workers expressed support for the idea of a four-day work week. In response, in December of 2021, U.S. Representative Mark DeCano, a Democrat from California, introduced a bill that would reduce the standard American work week from 40 hours to just 32. Takano's bill is worthy of note, but no one really expects Congress to pass the bill or drive the conversation. That's going to have to come from businesses who must be convinced that they will be rewarded with greater productivity and greater employee retention if they reduce hours. Only a small number of companies have bought into this already, but that number is growing fast. ZipRecruiter has reported that the number of job openings, including a four-day work week, has increased sevenfold over the last two years. It's still a tiny percentage of jobs, but expect more companies to consider it if tight labor markets and employee flight reflected in the Great Resignation continue into the future. Watch this space for updates, though maybe not on Fridays. We are still working a five-day working week in broadly the same hours as we were a century prior, despite a drastically different world and drastically changed economies, societies, cultures, and so on. You know, work has nevertheless broadly remained in place. So, you know, it's really ripe for reassessment and re-evaluation. Century Lives is produced by Kerry Thompson, Aaron Slomsky pritz and Cameron Chertavian. Music for this episode was provided by Ramteen Arablui and the Audio Network. Century Lives is a production of the Stanford Center on Longevity, where our mission is to support ideas and research so that century-long lives are healthy and rewarding ones. You can find out more about us at longevity.stanford.edu. Support for the Stanford Center on Longevity comes from the Annenberg Foundation, dedicated to addressing the critical issues of our time through innovation, community, compassion, and communication. Thanks for listening. I'm Ken Stern.